Welcome to Labor Economics. The book that we'll be using is Labor Economics by George Borjas, the eighth edition that came out in 2020. If you wish, you could also use the seventh edition. The differences between the seventh and the eighth editions aren't that large. So the book consists of 12 chapters. And the chapters that we will discuss in our eight week lecture series are uh, in black and the chapters that we'll skip are in gray. The first four chapters develop a uh, competitive model of the labor market or the supply demand model of the labor market. And then after chapter four, the book becomes more topical and we'll discuss chapter six, which highlights the role of uh, education, schooling for the labor market. Uh, chapter seven deals with wage inequality, chapter nine, discrimination in labor markets, and then finally chapter 12, uh, unemployment. So this chapter here is uh, an introductory chapter. And the main takeaway from this chapter is the way in which labor economists approach thinking about the labor market. So we start with an interesting fact. We then try to understand that interesting fact in a coherent framework, a model. It doesn't have to be a formal model, but at least you know, some sort of logical way to think about whatever it is that we observe and are interested in understanding. And once we have built a framework in our minds, what we wanna do is we don't wanna test that framework to see whether it's really a good approximation to think about the labor market. So then, you know, we're gonna estimate our model and even try to um, refute our model. And if it withstands criticism, then probably, you know, it's not a very bad way to think about um, the labor market along the lines that your model predicts. So let me start with some facts. So the, um, this is a the, the fact sheet from uh, the OECD Employment Outlook in 2019. And uh, the first row here talks about the risk of job automation. It talks about aging. And so these are very large kind of societal trends that we think also have uh, important impacts on labor markets, technology, globalization, demographical change are um, some of these very big societal trends that we suspect have uh, important impacts also on um, labor markets. The second row here talks about skills. So many workers do not have the right skills for the new jobs um, or training. Uh, so we'll have a separate chapter, uh, chapter six, talking about education and we'll also talk about on the job training uh, later on in, in, the, in the book. And then finally, um, the fact sheet talks about the, the rise in non-standard work. So the idea that uh, increasingly workers are no longer employed uh, as full-time workers in permanent contracts, but some workers work only part-time. Uh, some workers don't have permanent contracts, but um, fixed-term contracts, such as platform workers, or contract workers, or on-call workers. And we see those non-standard work arrangements rising in the economy. And an interesting question then, for example, is to what extent do these workers in these alternative work arrangements have the same social security compared to workers in uh, full-time permanent contracts? And towards the very end of the book, for example, we'll talk about uh, unemployment insurance. And um, okay, so this is the, the fact sheet for, um, from the OECD Employment Outlook uh, in May 2019. So the OECD Employment Outlook um, is published sometime, you know, around May, June um, of every year. Uh, if I take the fact sheet of the OECD Employment Outlook in May 2020, so that's this year, uh, it's all about COVID. So um, the first kind of panel here gives you the change in unemployment rates from January to May 2020 
uh, in several countries. So, for example, if you think of the United States, the unemployment rate in January was 3%, somewhere over 3%. In May, it stood at um, just below 12%. Also in Canada, there's been this big rise in the unemployment rate. If you look at France, for example, you see that the unemployment rate in France didn't increase at all. Now, that doesn't mean that the pandemic didn't have any impact on uh, the French labor market, because what happened in France and also um, to a large extent in other European countries, Italy, Germany, where you also don't see this rise in the unemployment rate, was that uh, there were job retention schemes in place. So rather than firms laying off workers and these workers claiming unemployment benefits, uh, what happened in um, European countries was that firms were given subsidies to retain workers. So workers were still sitting at home during the lockdown, for example, but the payroll that um, firms were carrying for these workers uh, was subsidized by these European governments. And whereas in the US, what happened was that there was policies expanded unemployment insurance, at least you know, for a while. So workers were just laying off workers. These workers became unemployed. That's why the unemployment rate increased. And then policies were supporting um, the unemployment insurance system rather than um, subsidizing firms to retain workers such that they could be called back once the, the lockdown was over. And you see indeed that in France, for example, uh, these job retention schemes have been much more important than in the United States or Canada. The second row gives you first some information about what happens to the number of hours worked, because irrespective of you know, whether policies were um, supporting unemployment insurance or whether supporting uh, firms' payrolls, you would still see, uh, expect to see a big impact on hours of work um, in these OECD countries. So this is the uh, average decline in hours of work across these OECD countries in the months following the start of the pandemic. That's the, the white line relative to what happens to hours of work um, in the months that followed the start of the global financial crisis in 2008-9. Uh, and <laughs> this is percentage-wise. So what you see, for example, is that um, in, this must have been May, I guess, or, or, or April, um, what you see is that in uh, that month, hours of work were about 16% lower. Um, so, um, so we're about 16% lower. This, if, or this is the, the, not in percentages, this is in hours of work. So if it's 16 hours a month, that's about, you know, if you work 160 hours a month, that's 10% that's lower. Um, I would have to check what exactly is your own vertical axis. Um, but anyway, you see this, this big drop in hours of work um, in the, the current pandem pandemic uh, relative to, for example, the, the previous crisis, the global financial crisis. And that is despite the fact that uh, two out of five workers were still able to uh, work from home. Uh, you could say, well, you know, two out of five, that's not a lot, uh, but it's at least um, more than zero. The final row here gives you, um, so it kind of illustrates the fact that the pandemic also has important distributional consequences. So the, the percentage of workers that stopped working altogether um, was 30% among the bottom 25% earners and was 14% among, among the top 25% earners. So what that means is that among low-wage workers, um, there were more workers that had to stop um, um, working compared to high-wage workers. So that kind of tells you that the pandemic has had um, a very, um, or could have had a very strong distributional, could have, be having a very strong distributional uh, impact uh, on um, labor markets. <clears throat> 
And then the final panel here is <clears throat> our projections for employment levels. Um, is the, the percentage change in employment under alternative scenarios. And these scenarios are either your single hit scenario or a double hit scenario. Now remember that this was published in uh, May 2020. I think it's you know, safe to say we're now November 2020 that um, European countries are definitely in a double hit scenario. The US probably is in, in a triple hit scenario. And you know what this suggests is at least what these simulations suggest is that there's no quick return to um, previous levels of, of um, employment, even up to um, the fourth quarter of 2021. So there's discussion going on on whether we, we would expect, um, in terms of employment, a very quick recovery, so a, a V-type recovery, or more like a, a Nike swoosh recovery, so a big drop and then still a, a relatively a quick return, but not as quick as, as, as uh, the drop was. was um, um, or, you know, there might not be a quick recovery at all. Um, so there's discussion going on what we expect, what we would expect to see uh, in terms of recovery in the labor market. So, okay, so these are, these are just some facts, okay? So whenever you, you you do labor economics, you want to start from an interesting fact. And then what you do is you try to uh, understand that fact, building um, a model a framework uh, of the labor market. And so here is you know, one popular model, uh, which is the competitive model, you know, what you know as, as the supply demand model. The, the competitive model makes three important assumptions. The first one is that each individual worker takes the wage as given when maximizing her utility. And then from this, we're gonna be deriving an expression for labor supply, the labor supply curve. Second, each individual firm is gonna take the wage as given and is then gonna maximize profits and deciding how many workers to hire for that given wage. And that will allow us to derive an expression for labor demand, labor demand curve. And three, for the market as a whole, the wage is gonna be flexible. It's gonna adjust such that demand equals supply in equilibrium. Now, it's important to realize the following. Wanting to Take the perspective of an individual worker uh, in an individual firm. And what one and two say is that each of those individual agents, they take the wage and other prices as given. So for example, when a firm decides how many workers to hire when maximizing profits, it takes the, the wage and all other prices as given uh, so it assumes that its own actions don't affect the wage. So at a, at a, at a micro level and at an individual level, level, individual workers, individual firms, we're going to assume that no single worker or group of workers has market power or no firm has uh, labor market power. So prices at the level of individual agents are taken as given. But then, you know, for the market as a whole, we do assume that these prices are flexible and adjust such that supply equals demand. Here is how you could take the competitive model um, to the data. So imagine that uh, so the, the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline, um, it, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not an, you don't need your imagination for that. So in, it's an example. Uh, in January 1968, oil was discovered in Prudhoe Bay, um, a remote area in northern Alaska. And what they had to do, of course, is to, you know, extract the oil and then transport it to the nearest port 
to then ship it to uh, mainland. And to, to transport it from Purdue Bay to, um, to Valdez, which was you know, the nearest port, they had to build a, uh, an oil pipeline and they had to build pump stations and a new tanker port, etc. And this happened between 1975 and 1977. Okay, so that's the fact that we're interested in, in um, understanding. So, so what was the impact of the discovery of oil on uh, the Alaskan labor market? And one way to approach this, this question is to say, okay, let's, let's think of the Alaskan market for, for engineers as, um, through the lens of the competitive model, which you know, would mean that there is a demand for engineers, there's a supply of engineers, and then what the um, discovery of oil and, and the consequent building of the, the pipeline implies is that the demand for engineers temporarily shifted out because you know these, these the pipeline had to be built these, these the infrastructure had to be built uh, between 1975 and 1977 so temporarily you would expect the demand for engineers to shift out graphically you get something as follows think of the um so demand so sorry the the uh, market for engineers uh in alaska uh, consisting of a labor demand curve, that's the blue line, a labor supply curve, that's the uh, black line. And in normal times, the Alaskan labor market is in equilibrium where employment is 20,000 and the annual wage is 40,000. And again, you know, what, we'll, we'll, what we will do when we develop the competitive model is to um, analyze what lies behind this, this demand curve and these will be those, those price-taking firms maximizing profits and for different levels of the wage ask a certain amount of labor to be employed. Uh, and we'll also, the same on the labor supply side, we'll dig a little bit deeper into uh, why this labor supply side, why this labor supply curve is upward sloping, um, assuming that each worker takes the wage as given and then decides how much work, how much labor to supply um, for different given wages. But we're looking here at the aggregate labor market. So I'm going to assume that in the aggregate, these wages are flexible, the wage is flexible, and it's going to settle at um, the level where supply equals demand. And then we have the discovery of um, the um, oil and um, the um, increased demand for engineers because of the, the infrastructure that has to be built. And you know, if the competitive model is a good way to approach the um, Alaskan labor market for engineers, we would expect to see that the demand shifts out. And so therefore employment to increase and wages to increase at least temporarily. So, you know, that's a prediction. So we've started from a fact, um, uh, we've, taken the, the competitive model as you know, our model, our starting point, uh, and um, we use that model to make predictions that we can take to the data. And here are the data. So it's two time series since 1968 up to 1985. The blue line are wages, and wages are um, indexed here on, on the right, vertical axis, it's monthly salaries. Um, and what you see, if you look at the, the time series for wages, is that indeed between 1975 and 1977, these wages really jumped up, which is consistent with this, this shifting out of the labor demand curve, um, thereby you know, increasing the wage. Also, for uh, employment, you see that um, employment went up. In, in the long run, you see that there is employment growth in the um, labor market in Alaska. Uh, this could be because there's population growth or there's migration uh, to Alaska, or whatever. But there seems to be this long run upper trend in um, employment in Alaska. And then what you also see is that that, that increase actually accelerated 
uh, during the, the construction of the oil pipeline. So again, you know, that's consistent with the idea that um, this, this oil pipeline did in, indeed, the construction of the oil pipeline did indeed uh, increase the demand for engineers in the Alaskan labor market. And so looking at these data, using the predictions from the competitive model, you would have to conclude that at least these data at first glance don't seem to be able to refute the competitive model. So maybe the competitive model is, in this case, uh, for this natural experiment, um, is not a, um, a very bad way to, to try to understand what happened um, on the labor market. So, of course, this doesn't mean that the competitive model is going to be our, our model of choice uh, in any circumstance at all time periods. But it is a very useful starting point. Remember, the labor market is an extremely complex place where you know, transactions between workers and firms are uh, very complex, they're multidimensional, et cetera, et cetera. What the competitive model does is it, it really cuts through that complexity by saying, okay, let's just assume that there's a supply side, a demand side, the individuals are small enough, enough on both sides to have no market power, and then in the aggregate prices are flexible, such that supply equals demand in equilibrium. It's a useful starting point. Um, you know, as I just illustrated with the, um, the Alaskan labor market data. Sometimes something that, some criticism that you sometimes also hear um, of the, the, the competitive model is that um, it leaves no room for, for policies or institutions. And I don't think that's true because you know, that's not what the competitive model assumes. Actually, um, the opposite is true. Uh, the competitive model assumes that there must be certain policies, regulation, and institutions in place, namely those policies, regulations, and institutions that can ensure that markets are free, competitive, and open. By free, I mean you know, whenever there is a transaction that would be beneficial to both the worker, workers and the firm, firms involved in that transaction, that transaction can happen. That's a free market. Um, a market where there's rationing is not a free market. Um, or, you know, a market, say, say think of the market um, of, of crime, you know, um, maybe criminals weigh off costs and benefits um, and decide to engage in a transaction to steal your car. Um, but, you know, for me, that transaction is not free um, if my car gets stolen. So that would be um, not a, a free market uh, and so also not a um, competitive market. Markets must also be competitive. So no individual worker, no individual firm has market power and open. So there cannot be, for example, uh, any discrimination in a competitive labor market. And so what we'll do in the book is we'll start off with the competitive model. So we will assume initially that markets are free, competitive and open. But then after chapter four, um, we'll also start looking into deviations from the competitive model. So, you know, what if groups of workers have market power through unions or firms have market power um, sort of monopsonists or oligopsonists, or what if there is discrimination in labor markets? Whenever we deviate from the competitive model, sometimes labor economists refer to that as considering imperfections. Um, it might not be a word that you you, pref you 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 might like. You know, think for example of a uh, a union. Um, a union doesn't have to be uh, an imperfection not even from a welfare perspective sometimes, um, but clearly, you know, discrimination um, is something that we would call from a nor more normative point standpoint um, imperfect. So I prefer to use, you know, the competitive model and then deviations from the competitive model 
rather than uh, imperfections, but um, it's just common language among economists to talk about imperfections when we consider deviations from the competitive model. Okay, just to, to illustrate how useful the competitive model can be as a starting point, an interesting question is, now that we're going through this pandemic, is the, you know, it's, it's obvious, you know, we've seen in, in, in the, the OECD dashboards that uh, employment is falling, so hours worked are falling. Is that mainly because of a um, decrease in labor supply or a decrease in labor demand? So you could um, look at the current pandemic and the fall in employment through the lens of the competitive model. And if you do that, you get um, the following uh, insights. So this is a, a, a figure that I uh, copied from um, a recent paper um, where, um, so these researchers, they looked at the, the growth rate of hours worked um, in the US in April, 2020. And so this first bar here, does that for the total private sector, so all private sectors together. What they found was that in April of 2020, in the US, hours of work decreased by 17%. What they also do is they then assume a competitive model and they decompose that decrease in hours worked into a red and a blue part where the, the red part is the contribution of an adverse supply shock to this reduction in hours worked. And the blue part is the uh, contribution of an adverse demand shock in hours worked, uh, to hours worked. And of course, you know, the way you have to think of this, this um, red part, so an adverse shock in labor supply, um, would be as follows. So imagine that you have a web shop and the pandemic arrives and your workers would usually be you know, maintaining your web page and generating sales. Your workers are you know, staying at home so they cannot work for you because they have to take care of the kids or they're ill. If, if that's, you know, if that's the constraint that binds for me, then that would be an adverse supply shock, even though I could still sell. So I still have customers that you know, could buy my products even sitting behind their computers at home. The constraint that I face um, as an entrepreneur are, um, are, is the input, is, is the labor to generate the sales, to maintain the web page. So that would be an adverse shock on the supply side that explains why um, hours of work fall. An adverse shock on the demand side would be different in that, um, for example, imagine that you have, um, you're running a cruise ship and um, in principle, you can find workers to um, go with you on that cruise ship to serve your customers. But customers are um, reluctant booking cruise, cruises these days because of, of fears of COVID. So, so even you know, if, if you imagine that you could have tests, et cetera, so you in principle could organize a, a trip that's perfectly safe, there's just no demand for um, your service. And that would be an, an adverse demand shock that um, reduces labor demand because you know if if I'm not sailing out, then you know I'm also not going to hire uh, workers uh, to go with me on that ship. Now, of course, the, the 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 researchers that are you know doing that decomposition here, they're not looking at cruise ships and and making you know and quantify you know whether that's a supply or how much is supply and demand, what they do is they look at wages. Because if you um, see that there is a fall in hours, whether a, that's mainly driven by an adverse supply or an adverse demand shock, 
you can read that off um, of what happens to wages. So if, if hours fall and wages would tend to go up, then that suggests that the sub adverse supply shock is more important than the adverse demand shock. And so the red is more important than the blue. If you would see that together with falling employment, also wages would be falling rapidly, then that would suggest that you know, the fall in hours is mainly driven by a fall in um, demand for labor. And so the blue is more important than the red. And that's an important takeaway from um, the competitive model is that predictions are that if there's demand shocks, that employment and wages move in the same direction. So whether supply as demand shifts out or in you know, employment and wages are both going to shift out or, um, or going to increase or decrease. And so the correlation between wages and, and um, employment or prices and quantities is positive when um, demand is, gonna, is, is shifting about. When supply shocks are more um, or happening, then you expect that, or you expect to see that uh, wages and employment move in opposite directions. So we have a negative correlation. Um, if if supply shifts in, then you know hours are falling as we see here, but then wages would have to go up. Or if supply shifts out, we would expect that employment increases but wages fall. So that's a negative correlation. And so an important way to identify um, supply or demand shocks is to look at what happens, what happens to both the quantity and the price side, what happens to both employment and wages and see whether they, they um, go vary uh, positively or negatively. Now, okay, so, so you know, what you see by and large is that supply shocks uh, have been more important than adverse demand shocks for the total private sector, but also in each and every sector. What's also remarkable is the heterogeneity across sectors, which I think is um, one of the, the key characteristics of the ongoing pandemic. It's, it's the heterogeneity um, that, we, um, that we see uh, across sectors, which you know, in large part is, is, is because these supply shocks um, have been very sector specific. Um, the next graph does the same exercise, but now for not April, but May 2020. And um, you see that in uh, May 2020, there was, there was somewhat of a, a reversal in hours work, not, not much. Um, but still you see that the supply side is more important. Um, so this could be because you know, workers were allowed back into work into workplaces um, or, or other reasons that, that um, was um, marginally uh, shifting out the, the labor supply um, side of, 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 uh, of work. Uh, and again, you know, you see that the supply side seems to be the most important driver also in May. And um, with again, a lot of heterogeneity across sectors. This doesn't mean that the, the demand side cannot become more important than supply side, for example, in the long run. So it's, imagine that in the long run, um, all workers are uh, vaccinated, so they're all recovered, um, and they can all go back to work. If this current pandemic is changing in a structural way, the consumption patterns of, of, of um, individuals, or households, then you, know, you might see that in the long run, demand for um, cruise ships, for example, might um, stay low, perhaps forever, uh, which of course would in the long run mean that um, the, the, the sector of, of cruise ships or travel uh, is going to be kind of permanently hurt by uh, this, this adverse long run structural shift uh, in product demand and therefore also uh, labor demand. Okay, so that's just, you know, one illustration of how you can try to make sense of um, what's going on in today's labor market, given the, the pandemic that we're, we're going through. 
um, and it, it's of course in in a way it's pushing the the supply demand framework in a sense that you know imagine that think of a, a full blown lockdown um, you know where where everybody is is basically some sort of sense you know jailed at home um, then it becomes very difficult whether that's um, you know mainly resulting or, or implying that there is an adverse supply or demand shock um, but you know at least you know for for the kind of the partial lockdowns and and uh, that we've had in in today's labor markets the competitive model does, does seem to uh, provide some insights in in how to think about what's going on in in today's labor market in terms of wages and employment okay so um finally estimating models so whenever we have if we've looked at a fact we've thought about it we have a um a framework a model that we think could explain uh, that fact we don't want to test that model um, in a way that you know, the data could refute the model so you know, we want to be critical of of ourselves we want to be critical of, of the model as a way to um, understand the labor market as, as a way of you know, seeing causal relationships in labor markets and so estimating models is something that we'll also do um, in this course so that's also why this course is uh, both trying to um, enable you to build models but then also giving you the toolkit to take these models to data and do regressions for example so here is one example of how you can take a model to, to the data and we're going to come back to that in chapter six when we talk about education but imagine that you're interested in the estimating the return to schooling because what you have in mind is um, a model that says that education the time that you know kids spend in in um, in college that you know that's giving them knowledge that is productive later on in the labor market and if it's productive then you know that education that they accumulate in a college is going to result in higher wages now this is of course a very peculiar way to think about the importance of education and labor economists are fully aware that education is not just an investment um, in your human capital that allows you to earn uh, wages higher wages later on in life uh, we labor economists realize that you know education also has an important cultural component is important for your self-development etc um, but you know for now you just stick to this story that um, education is, is just an investment and um, there is a return on that investment which is called the return to schooling and we want to estimate that return to schooling so we want to know what how much more you would be uh, you would be expected to earn when you um, take a bachelor's degree compared to your friends who um, didn't go to college and um, one way so so you know you you want to you want to so you have this idea that there's this causal relationship between the education that you have and the wages so education is making workers more productive because it, it accumulates knowledge and if they're more productive they can earn higher wages now we want to estimate that model and here's one way of doing that so imagine that you have data um, and you know these dots here are you know occupations and for each occupation you have the average years of schooling so for example this here might be you know cleaners um, the average cleaner only has about 10 years of, of schooling and you also observe their wages the mark of the wage um, and so this might be cleaners this here might be doctors who have you know, on average uh, a higher uh, level of occupation uh, level of education and also earn higher wages and so you, you you have more than two occupations so you have many occupations and for each of these occupations you have the um, 
education level of the average worker and um, her wage in logs. And what you see is that you clearly see that there is this positive correlation between years of schooling and the log wage. Uh, and so, you know, you think, well, you know, maybe my model is, is, you know, is on the money, um, uh, literally. Um, and so, you know, more years of schooling means that, you know, kids who've spent longer uh, in college have accumulated more knowledge um, and therefore can earn higher wages because they're just more productive on the job. So you have this cloud of data points and there seems to be this positive correlation. One way of summarizing this cloud of data points is by asking Stata or any other program to um, run a, a regression line through this cloud of points, which is this blue line here, uh, which is basically, you know, if you, if you think of regression or ordinary least squares, what's going to happen is that Stata is going to minimize the, the distance between uh, each of the points and, and this line. So this, what Stata is going to do is it's going to choose this line here, the position of that line, such that the, the, the distance between uh, each of the dots and that line is minimized. And so you're not going to see a line somewhere here or here, but you know you're going to see a line that that you know pretty much goes through this through this this cloud of points uh, in a sensible way. And the the slope of this blue line here is going to be an estimate of the returns to schooling, because imagine two occupations or take two occupations. Um, that differ um, in the average years of schooling in that one has one year more um, of um, schooling than the other. So maybe, you know, one occupation has 14 years of schooling on average, and there's another one, you know, this one maybe, that has 13 years of schooling on average. And then what this blue line is going to say is that, okay, so I, you know, pretty much expect that um, the wage difference in logs between that occupation with 14 years of schooling and 13 years of schooling is going to be this much. It's going to be this much. Um, and so the, 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 the steeper that line is, um, the bigger that my um, regression line predicts that that wage difference will be between these two occupations. So the higher my return to school is. And that's how this the slope of this line here is telling you something about um, the, the return to schooling. Okay, you can formalize that or you know, express that same intuition in a somewhat more formal way. So imagine that you have a model in mind. So this is my model of, of you know, education leading to more knowledge, which makes you more productive, which increases your, your wages and therefore also the log of the wage. So you have this model in mind that says that the, the wage in an occupation J is you know, some constant alpha plus um, beta times SJ, SJ is years of schooling or on average in an occupation. Uh, and then epsilon is, is just some unobserved error term. So that's basically the difference between um, Okay, so some unobserved error term. Okay. So um, where alpha and beta are the parameters uh, and um, epsilon is the unobserved error term. And remember that I'm most interested in this beta, which is the slope of that blue line. And I wanna get an estimate of beta. So, you know, how much more than does someone, or does um, an occupation that has um, workers in an occupation that has one year more of, schooling are expected to earn. And so, you know, you can ask Stata to, to run that line through that cloud of points as I showed on the previous slide. And what you see is that you have an estimate, an OLS estimate for um, alpha equal to 0.86. And you have an OLS estimate for beta uh, equal to 0 
And so 0 0.14 is just the slope of the line, the blue line that I've shown you on the previous graph. And so we've now quantified the, the slope of that line, which you know, we, we say, so we, we, we think is, is a good pro approximation for the return to schooling. But how do we interpret this, this point 14? What does it mean? Um, now remember that on the left-hand side, our dependent variable is not the wage level, but it's the log wage uh, in an occupation. And so what the point 14 means is that if I compare two occupations, J and J tilde, and the average worker in J has one more year of schooling compared to the average worker in J tilde, then the log difference between these two occupations is expected to be uh, 0 0.14. Now, one thing that we will do throughout this course is to interpret log differences as percentage differences. So a log difference of 0 0.14, we're going to call that a 14% higher wage in J compared to J tilde. And that's okay as long as, as this number, that log difference that you find, isn't, isn't too big. Um, if it's if it if it's very big, so say if it's you know if it's one or one and a half or even higher, then the log differences are underestimates of um, percentage differences. But you know, by and large, we're just going to assume that whenever we see a log difference, that you know um, it's going to be a percentage difference. Okay, so. You know, so far so good. I mean, we, we, we had this model in mind that, you know, education is making workers more productive. So we predicted that, our model predicted that more educated workers would have to earn higher wages, which you know, seemed to hold in the data. Uh, and we actually have been able to quantify that uh, as, you know, a 14% return to schooling. So one year more of schooling is increasing, we ex expect it to increase your earnings by 14%. So a bachelor's degree is three years of education. We would expect that, you know, you would expect that your earnings are uh, three times 14%. Um, so you know, somewhere around 40, 45% higher compared to your friends that um, didn't go to college. Now, the, the problem with, the potential problem with um, stopping here is that the 14% might actually not be a good estimate of the causal impact of um, schooling on wages for the average worker in the population. And you know, that is because the OLS estimator has to satisfy a number of requirements or criteria for it to be uh, an unbiased and consistent estimate of uh, the true impact of schooling on wages. And there are two requirements that um, we're going to be focusing on throughout the course. And especially the first one is going to haunt us um, in most of the chapters. And that's the requirement of what's known as no endogeneity. And the no endogeneity requirement implies that the, implies the assumption that the covariance between the independent variable, the regressor SJ, and the error term has to be zero. And you might think, well, that's just some, some statistical assumption that I'm not interested in. But I'll, I'll provide some intuition in, in a second uh, when this could not be true. Uh, and so when things go wrong uh, in using OLS as, a, as, you know, as the tool from your toolkit to test the model. And uh, the second problem that um, we 
we talk about in this chapter here is what's known as no sampling bias. It's, it's something that we are um, not going to return to, uh, I think, at all in, in, in the following chapters, but it is something that is often discussed among labor economists or econ economists more, general, more generally. Um, and so, you know, I have one slide that also talks about the, the problems with uh, sampling bias. But let me first focus on the endogeneity uh, problem. So uh, let me return to my um, graph. So this is my, my data plot. And, you know, all the blue stuff I've shown you before, what I've now added is, uh, are the two black circles. And what they capture is the following. So imagine that among these workers that are in, in occupations that uh, have high educational attainment rates on average and high wages on average, that these are the people or workers that are also of high ability on average. I think of high ability as maybe IQ. And uh, the, the occupations that are um, requiring less um, years of schooling on average and, and pay lower wages are um, people that are of low ability or, or low IQ uh, on average. And you have to think of ability here as something that affects your earnings power, irrespective of how much education you have. So one way to think of it is as follows. So imagine that you have this group of low ability people here and you, you could force them to uh, increase their schooling. Um, then, you know, what's gonna happen is that they, they're gonna, uh, this circle here is gonna move to the right but it's going to end at a, at a lower place than the circle for high ability workers, which is just saying that if you would give high and low ability workers the same level of schooling, or compare a high and a low ability worker with the same level of schooling, they would still earn different wages because higher ability workers are just more productive on the job, irrespective of the level of education that they have. So ability in itself, irrespective of the level of education, is increasing a worker's uh, earning power, earn, um, earnings. Now, of course, the, the, the way I've drawn it here is such that these high ability workers tend to sort into these, these occupations that also require um, higher levels of education and, and vice versa, the low ability workers just happen to sort into those occupations um, that require um, lower levels of, of education and also pay uh, lower wages. And, and, and that's not entirely counterintuitive. So if you think of ability as say, IQ, then um, you know, it, it's not inconceivable that smarter kids, uh, at least you know, when it comes to academic IQ, um, that smarter kids um, go to college and um, other kids are less likely to go to college. But then, you know, these smarter kids, they will earn higher wages, not only because they went to college, uh, but also and even maybe mainly because they're just um, of higher, of higher um, IQ. Um, so this sorting of, of high ability workers into um, more education and low ability workers into less education, yeah, that, that's not entirely counterintuitive. But of course, you know, when, when that happens, so when you have this sorting of um, workers of high ability into more schooling and low ability into less schooling, when that happens, my OLS estimate is, and the interpretation of my OLS estimate is gonna become problematic. Because the slope of this line here, which was my, my OLS estimate for beta, is 
going to be capturing to some extent not just what my model predicts the returns to schooling so the fact that you know schooling makes these workers more productive and therefore earn, allows them to earn higher wages but it's also going to be capturing that um you know these these workers with these higher levels of schooling are workers with higher levels of ability um and and so the the slope of this blue line here is going to be upper biased so one way to one extreme way to think about it is imagine that my model my true model would uh, not predict that higher levels of schooling would increase uh, earnings so higher levels so, so what 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 kids learn in college um is just waste and it doesn't make them more productive um, and so it doesn't increase their earnings potential what that implies graphically would be that the true model predicts just the horizontal line whichever way if whichever level of schooling you have that's not going to affect your wages but it could still be that that stata is going to give me um, this blue line here because you know for some reason the high ability kids are the ones that end up going to college because they like it, not because they, they, they learn anything that's useful in the labor market, because they, they just like it. And so what my um, or less estimate for beta is gonna be doing, it's gonna be entirely driven by the fact um, that these, were, these um, occupations with higher levels of schooling on average um, are, um, are higher ability people. And again, you can formalize that intuition uh, as follows. So think of um, epsilon j not as the unobserved error term, but as um, the um, unobserved ability, um, average ability in an occupation. And you know what I've just said about you know these higher ability kids moving or sorting into these occupations that are also requiring higher levels of schooling statistically implies that there's going to be a positive correlation between SJ and epsilon J. And so that correlation is now strictly positive, whereas the no endogeneity assumption required that that correlation or that covariance must be zero. And I've also said that you know, when that no endogeneity assumption is violated, as it is here, you're going to have an upper biased estimate of the uh, returns to schooling. And that's also something you can formalize. So we know from your econometrics courses that the, in a simple regression, the OLS estimate for beta is nothing more than the covariance between the dependent variable and the regressor divided by the variance of the regressor. I can, for the log of the wage, I can plug in the, the true model. So that's the model that I have in my mind. That is alpha plus beta sj plus epsilon j. And then I can work out this covariance. So I can look at the covariance between alpha and sj. That's zero because alpha is a constant. Divided by the variance of sj is zero. The covariance between beta sj and sj is beta times the variance of sj. And again, I again divided by the variance of sj, that's beta, that's this beta here. And then finally, the covariance between epsilon j and sj divided by the variance of sj, that's this term here, the covariance between epsilon j and sj divided by the variance of sj. And so what the no endogeneity assumption implied was that this covariance was zero. So there's no correlation between um, the regressor and the unobserved error term. And you see that if, if that covariance is zero, then this whole term here disappears. And the OLS estimate for beta is um, a good approximation of a good estimate of the, the true coefficient. It, it's a consistent estimate of the true uh, return to schooling. Now, even if beta is zero, um, 
OLS um, estimates for beta um, would be um, zero. As long as the no endogeneity assumption is satisfied. But if it's not satisfied, you know, as, as, as in my um, case here, when there is ability bias, so this covariance is strictly positive, you see that this, this the whole term here is going to be uh, strictly positive. And so my OLS estimate for beta is going to be equal to the true coefficient, so the true causal impact of more schooling on earnings, but then plus something else, which is what we will call um, the ability bias. And so my OLS estimate as a whole is going to be bigger than the true impact, or the OLS estimate is going to be an upper biased estimate of the true causal impact of um, educational schooling. And again, you know, the, the reasoning is that in part the OLS estimate is, is driven by the fact that it's picking up not only the, the true causal impact, but it's also picking up the fact that these high ability kids go to college longer um, and uh, ability itself is increasing earnings power uh, irrespective of the level of education that workers have. So ability itself, epsilon itself, is directly related to the wage. A high epsilon is directly increasing the wage. But then it's also correlated with SJ, and that's why the OLS estimate is upper biased. You also see that, you know, if you could think of a story where um, this covariance would be negative, um, you would get an underbiased estimate. So, you know, um, no endogeneity doesn't imply that um, OLS must always be upper biased. You can also think of circumstances where um, endogeneity leads to downward biased estimates. But we're mainly, in, we're mainly concerned about upper biased estimates because that would lead us to conclusions about the significance of, in this case, education for earnings um, that are exaggerated. An underbiased estimate is, you know, in a way, and it's still bad, but it's, in a way, you, it's, it's like a lower bound um, estimate of, of whatever causal impact that you're um, looking at. Okay, so um, what can be done? So a lot of what we're gonna do in, um, in the chapters in the, in the book is trying to deal with that endogeneity problem. And um, so this is something that is part of the, ev the everyday life of, of labor economists and, and economists in general. And to illustrate that, uh, look at this, this, these first two panels here. So what they show you is a time series uh, of uh, sort of like a, a word count um, that you know, expresses the importance, or captures the importance of the word identification. You could think of it as, you know, endogeneity problems uh, in publication, so in academic publications from, from two series of, of um, journals, um, the NBR working paper series, and then academic um, uh, publishers. But, you know, that, that's not that important now. So what you see is that, um, at least since since the nine, since 1980, economists and also labor economists have become increasingly uh, more concerned about. You know, we estimate something, but is it really a reliable estimate of of the causal impact that um, our model that we have in our minds predicts? The, this panel here looks at. Um, a more specific way to deal with identification problems, which is the use of quasi-experimental methods. So, for example, the uh, Trans-Alaska oil pipeline example that I gave earlier, uh, we, we call that a quasi-natural experiment. It's, it's just something that happened that allows me to test, uh, so the discovery of oil, that allows me to test the um, competitive model for the Alaskan labor market for engineers. Uh, so, so that's that's one quasi-experimental method um, that we um, that we're going to be. So this kind of 
experimental methods or quasi-natural experiments we'll be exploiting later on and using difference in differences, etc., cetera, um, as alternatives to OLS. Um, and so what you see is that, especially you know, since, since the, the 1990s, there's been this, this very rapid rise in uh, other methods than OLS. And that's because you know, OLS still is the, the, the starting point, just as you know, um, if you build a model or think of a model, your first step would be the competitive model. OLS is like you know, the first step that you would take um, when you take your model to the data. Um, but, you know, increasingly we've extended our um, toolkit uh, of, of experimental methods to go beyond OLS and um, uh, that involves difference in differences, fixed effects, instrumental variables, uh, regression, discontinuity designs, etc. All of which we will uh, touch upon um, at some point during, during this le these lectures. And you know the fact that you know it, it's growing very rapidly since the, the mid 1990s is also a phenomenon known as as the credibility revolution in economics. So, you know, to be sure, to um, that our models are are really capturing uh, how the labor market works, uh, we need to use convincing methods. We need to use methods that are um, credible. Um, or credible tests of um, the models. Okay, um, the, the second problem um, are, so the first problem is the no endogeneity problem. The second problem that I mentioned is sampling bias. Uh, I'm just gonna show you uh, one or two slides. It's, it's much less of a serious problem, at least in this course, but I think it's still important to, to, illust to kind of illustrate because students are sometimes a bit confused about um, the difference between an endogeneity problem, for example, an, an omitted variable bias problem um, versus uh, a sampling bias problem. So imagine that, um, and I'm returning to, to my, to my um, data graph here, so the blue is again what we had before, but now imagine that you, you only observe the black dots. So for, for some reason, you, you cannot observe all occupations uh, in the data, but you just happen to observe only the, the black dots. So imagine that these, are, these happen to be uh, occupations with a, a higher fraction of women. So, all the black occupations are occupations that um, have an above average fraction of women employed in the labor market. And also imagine that the, the return to schooling for women, for some reason, maybe there's discrimination or whatever, um, that the return to schooling for women is is less than the, the return to schooling is on average for the population or the average person in the population. And so I have these black dots here, which are these, these female intensive occupations. Um, but of course, because the, the return to schooling for women is lower, um, if I then draw a line through these black dots, I'm going to find a line that has um, a lower slope, so that's flatter than uh, the blue line. When that happens, so when you have um, a subsample of data, which you know we always, almost always have, um, and when that subsample implies that your 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 sampling along a certain dimension of heterogeneity in the returns to schooling, um, you're in problem. You're 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 in trouble because you know again you know you're going to ask Stata to to run a line through these points, and you know Stata is going to tell you give you a coefficient of I don't know point point oh five um, something lower than point fourteen it would then be wrong to conclude that the um, 
return to schooling for the average person in the population would be um, 5%, whereas it's actually higher, it would be 14%. And that's called the sampling problem. Formally, what this means is that, so assume that for some reason, the return to schooling is lower for women. And you know that could be several reasons, but you know just assume that that's the case. And assume that we only observe a subsample of occupations, J tilde, for which the female uh, share is higher than average. So the female share F for occupation J tilde is higher than the um, share of women um, in, on average, across all occupations J. So F bar J is the average female share across all occupations J. Then what, what sampling bias is, is, is captured by is the idea that the, the expected wage for um, uh, conditional on schooling. So you're going to say, you know, I have a certain, I think of a certain level of schooling and I'm going to be predicting the wage where um, the beta tilde is the estimate that I get from my subsample, um, that that wage is going to be lower than the expected wage that um, that person with that same level of schooling would have if I would have estimated the returns to schooling accurately, i.e. You know, for um, the average person in uh, the population. And so in this case, the, the um, beta tilde OLS is, is a downward biased estimate of, of beta. Um, and, you know, what can be done? Well, there's, there's several, there's basically, so in, in the appendix, and I'm not going to go there, um, the appendix to the slides gives you two ways to, to uh, deal with this problem, depending on, on whether you um, observe the, um, the fraction of females in each occupation um, or not. Um, but again, you know, I'm not going to go there for the reason that, you know, this is a problem that we're not going to come back to um, later on in the chapters. But, you know, be aware that there is, there is when you use OLS, there's potentially a, a number of, of, of problems when interpreting the coefficients in a causal way. The most important problem is the no endogeneity problem. Um, the second most important problem is, is this sampling bias problem. Um, and throughout the lectures, we're going to be focusing on how can you deal with this no endogeneity problem, but you might sometimes hear um, about the, the sampling problems as well. Um, so let me wrap up. So labor economics studies, um, important fact. So try to think of, as a labor economist, try to think of um, facts that you observe uh, that you think are important. And then what you have to do is, you know, try to get your head around some sort of consistent way, conceptual framework, a model to better understand these facts. And so a useful starting point is the competitive model. But we, we realize that, you know, labor markets are not always and everywhere perfectly competitive. And so also in this course, we'll, we'll gradually move away from the competitive model by introducing imperfections or deviations from uh, the supply, the simple supply demand framework. And then finally, what you should always try to do is to um, test your model and be very critical. And um, try to prove yourself wrong. And if even your own scrutiny, um, if, your model, if your model survives your, your own scrutiny, um, I think that that should give you a lot of confidence that the way you think the labor market works might actually be a good approximation
for the facts that you're interested in explaining. So this is it for chapter one. Um, talk soon. Bye-bye.